Uh, please let me rejoice with you that um, God has given you not only an academic president, but a warm-hearted president. And I suppose um, being in church work and um, having connections with Bible colleges, etc., there is a real appreciation in my heart for the warm and anointed presentation that we got from our president this evening. And I do want to encourage you to certainly support your school, for it is so very, very important. Praise God forevermore. Yesterday morning, I think it was, we were sharing a word with the congregation that was here, and we just didn't get through that message. And someone said, well, I hope you finish it tonight. That I could not say, for, you know, I'm one of those preachers that sails on the seal orders. And we never quite know until we get the command from above. Preachers, it's just a wonderful thing when you are certain in your heart, this is it. This is what you are to do, this is what you are to say. Now there are times when we have to preach when it isn't that clear, but it is a wonderful thing to have that divine green light. And so I feel that um, I do have the divine green light tonight to finish up this little word from John's Gospel, chapter 12. And the core verse of it is verse 24. St. John's 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And from Brother Humble's message, he was sharing on the doubles of a two-fold work of grace. And studying for this message, this new insight came that we have a similar expression in John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And as, of course, over here in John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And we have in this passage... God's way to abundant living. And we pointed out that the way to abundant living must begin as Jesus began with a miraculous birth. And that we must come to John 3.3 3 before we can come to John 12.24. We must be born again. We must be living beings in order to be live kernels of wheat that we can fall into the ground and die. There must be a miraculous birth. Or as Jesus puts it, we must be born again. We must be born from above. We must be people who have had two births. We must be people of the second birth. We must not only have a first and physical birth. If we are going to see the Lord Jesus, we must have a second and spiritual birth. We're not talking about having your name on a membership roll. 
We're not talking about being active in the church. We're not talking about that sort of thing. We are talking about that miraculous and wonderful uh, experience with God when he comes in and brings us from the death of sin to the life of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, the miracle of it all. And we pointed out that in this passage that if we are going to be to experience this miraculous birth we must have true conversion we must have true conversion using conversion there in a broader sense than its theological term of turning around true conversion we must be truly born again and if we're going to have true conversion there must be a real leaving to follow Jesus. We had so many people in John chapter 12 who appeared to want to follow Jesus, but when the chips were down, it was a different story. Friends, if we are going with God, there must come some time in our lives when we recognize the awfulness of sin, we recognize the guilt of sin, we recognize the rebellion of sin, we recognize the uselessness of sin, the senselessness of sin, and we make up our minds by the grace of God, I am saying goodbye to the old sin life and the old sin crowd once and for all. Really, that's what it needs to be. Goodbye to the lying, goodbye to the stealing, goodbye to the fornication, goodbye to the adultery, goodbye to the defiling of the temple of God, goodbye to everything that is evil. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I just wish you would preach for me. Why don't you preach with me or something? Don't, don't, you know, don't let me get torn to pieces up here with a good feeling. The sheer absolute, go absolute good feeling of having, by the grace of God, been able to come to the end of all the meanness, the sin, the wickedness, the shame, the debauchery, the whole works. Oh, the sheer joy of it. Hallelujah. To get out of the hands of the old, wicked, deceiving, uh, binding Satan. To be delivered from old Egypt. And say goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. You know there is a beautiful kind of, um, of, of sequence. If we put it into the sequence of Israel leaving Egypt. Moses says, God says to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, what about worshipping in the land? You know that little study in, in, the, in the book of Exodus? You can hunt it up, hunt it up, preachers. I'm sure you know it. It's an old, old one. Go worship the Lord in the land. You know, that's what a lot of people want to do today. They want to just go right on in their sin and still be saved. And Moses said, no business, Pharaoh. My uh, commission is that we are going out of Egypt to serve the Lord. Yeah. Not worshipping the Lord in the land. There are too many people who are trying to serve God in their sin. It can't be done. It just isn't real. My heart's getting pretty serious. Oh God, oh God, oh God, help us. It just seems that there are some awful false prophets abroad today who seem to let people get by with the idea that they can go right on in their sin. You know, we have some serious problems in the Holiness Church these days. I heard a little lady talking and I wasn't eavesdropping, she was just talking. And her parents were godly and her parents overprotected her and her parents this and her parents that. But now she has left home and she has gotten into a 
Christian college. It's not the one you're thinking of, it's the other one. <laughs> and then her friends ask her, have you done this yet? No. Have you done that yet? What's that? They say, you'll find out. You'll soon be like the rest of us. And from her conversation, I gather that the young lady has broken over all boundaries until her broken-hearted father called her a name that I, I'm not going to repeat publicly tonight, but she said it of herself. Said, this is what my dad said I am now. And she just went on. And you know, her concept was that she is now liberated. She has gotten away from all of that oppressive, depressing bondage. She is now liberated. And here is the serious statement. She said, the one little problem I ran into was that Satan was trying to make me lose my faith in God. Says that's just the one problem I ran into. In this liberation that she talks about, she did experience, as she say, the pressure of the enemy to try to make her lose her faith. And what she actually is saying is that she just needs to keep believing that she is still God's child and she can go on liberated. Come, come, my dear friends. There must be a real leaving to follow Jesus. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and what? And forsaketh. There must be a real leaving to follow Jesus. Go worship the Lord in the land, says Pharaoh. No business, says Moses. All right, he says, um, uh, go, but let your flocks and your herds be stay, be, be, be remain here in Egypt. And Moses says, but we need those for our blood sacrifice. We can't serve God without atonement. And then Pharaoh says, all right, you can go, but leave the wives and the children behind. Whoever heard that one? Husbands, would you settle for that sort of thing? You go and leave the wives and children behind? And too many of us have left too many things behind. If we're going, let's go clean with God. Amen. Nothing to pull us back. Let us break all the ties. Let's burn all the bridges. We're going with God. There must be a real leaving to follow Jesus. But there must not only be a real leaving to follow Jesus, there must be righteous life in finding Jesus. Salvation is not just negative. Salvation is not just, I don't lie, I don't steal, and I don't uh, commit adultery, and uh, that sort of thing. Salvation isn't just negative. It is, it does have negative to it, but it isn't all negative. I don't know whether I'll come to this in this camp, but let me just throw it in here while you're here. You know, some people say, but um, God is too negative. The church is too negative. Wait a minute. God didn't create any negatives. The devil created the negatives. What do you want God to tell you? Thou shalt lie? Satan brought in lies. What do you want God to say? Thou shalt lie and thou shalt steal. There's nothing God can say. Thou shalt not lie. Satan brought in the negative. Satan brought in the sin, and the sin caused the negative. That's, that's where negatives come from. If there were no sin, there would be really no negative. Come, come, my friends. These people who are always fussing about the negatives. Well, friends, I, I just, what else? I don't want God to tell me thou shalt lie. 
Do you? I want him to tell me thou shalt not lie. But thank God he doesn't stop there. He comes in with the positive thou shalt love and all the rest of it because he gives us his own glorious life. And friends, there's the miracle. There is the miracle of the birth. Don't ask me how, how it is done. I don't know. But when we get to the end of our sin and when we believe the Lord Jesus Christ, blessed be the name of God, the miracle takes place and God puts within our hearts the very nature of God, the very life of God. Amen. And friends, you know what I thought about as I was praying this afternoon? When you don't know what else to do but believe God, do the only thing you can do, believe God. Amen. Preacher, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. I got to that place too. I didn't know what else to do. And yet, you know, this miracle of being saved, how am I going to get across here? How is it going to be accomplished? When I didn't know what else to do, I did the only thing that there was to do. I fell into the arms of a loving Savior. And he changed me in an instant. He made me a new creation a new creature all things passed away all things became new praise god it's the nature of a fish to swim it's the nature of a bird to fly it's the nature of a pig to gravel it's the nature of a skunk you ask um um uh, uh, brother kunkel what's the nature of a skunk and um it's the nature of a christian to live righteously And if God can make an apple tree to produce apple fruits and make a pear tree to produce pear fruits, God Almighty, the creator of the ends of the earth, the redeemer of all mankind, can make a Christian to be righteous. Hallelujah. Please forgive me for shouting at you, but oh, it's sweet. I say, oh, it's sweet to be a child of God got a dear gentleman who is a precious friend. We prayed together and wept together. He tells me, Wingrove, ten years ago, ten years ago I was a worthless, no good drunkard. My wife was almost at the end of the line. My children were ashamed of me. I wouldn't go to church. I was just a hopeless drunkard he says they gave up on me almost but one day in my home half an hour before I had no thoughts of God in half an hour I was sobered and on my knees and saying God if you can do anything for an old wreck like me do it and God saved that man. Delivered him from the drink. And delivered him from the life of wastage. And saved him. And gave him the nature of God. Can you hardly keep still tonight because you are among the twice born? I say, can you hardly keep still in your seat this evening because you are among the twice born? And if you aren't, blessed be the name of God. Heaven's midwives are ready to do the job. Amen. Amen. The eternal God is ready to give you a new nature and make you a new person. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. God can save you so that you are victorious. You live victorious. Amen. So as Brother Conkle say, we may stub our toe and fall, but blessed be the name of God. There are some of us by his grace who have been walking with him and walking victorious lives. Amen.
We don't need to be unfaithful to our wives and we don't need to be unfaithful to our husbands and we don't need to be tied up in dishonesty and what have you. We can live victorious lives for he puts his nature within us and it is now natural that we should live like him. There must be a miraculous birth and if there's going to be a miraculous birth there must be true conversion. There must be real leaving to follow Jesus. There must be righteous life in finding Jesus. The miraculous birth involves, as part of the process of knowing God, it involves temptations, crisis. But we will not deal with that this evening. But friends, now here is this miraculous birth. And here is the, is the wonderful, beautiful paradox. We were dead in sin. But now we are quickened with him and made alive. And now that we are alive, Jesus says, friend, you've got to die. Isn't that interesting? We were dead in trespasses and sins. He quickened us and made us alive. And now he says, friend, you've got to die. For you see, we too must be like Jesus. There was his miraculous birth. And the temptation was that Satan was always trying to keep him back from death. Don't die. Don't go to the cross. Don't go to the cross. The temptations in the wilderness, as we heard this morning, was uh, in another way of looking at it. Do, but don't die. Do, but don't die. You know, the church is full of people who just want to do, 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 do. It's activity, 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 activity. Do, but don't die. And when he took him up on the pinnacle of the temple to, to cast himself down, the, the, the sort of temptation was to showmanship, but not sacrifice. And friend, God knows we have enough, we, we have too much showmanship in the church. And friends, whatever salvation is all about, it is not about showmanship. Come, come, my dear friends. And we do not need to let Hollywood push us and pull us and confuse us. For whatever salvation is all about, it is not about showmanship. That's, that's Satan's temptation. That's the crisis I was just mentioning about saying that we're not going into it. But there it is in a nutshell. Do but don't die. Showmanship but not sacrifice. And then when he said fall down and worship me, the temptation was to compromise rather than crucifixion. But friends, the only hope for you and me was that Jesus should die. If he did not die... His perfect life would only haunt us and hound us. But he died. Praise God. And friends, I want to tell you tonight that the only hope for you and me spiritually is that we should die. In fact, he gave us life so that we might die. That's the whole idea. He took us out of Egypt that we might go into Canaan. The object was not just being out of Egypt, the object was Canaan. And the out of Egypt was only to prepare us to go into Canaan. The object is not just the new birth, the object is that we should have abundant life. The object is that we should be sanctified holy. The object is that we should be made holy. And the new birth is, the, is, 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 the, is only the, the initial operation to prepare us for holiness. You remember in Egypt, uh, you remember rather in, 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 in old Canaan, you couldn't bring a dead animal and sacrifice it. That was abomination. A sinner cannot possibly come in the act of total gift and consecration. A sinner has nothing to give the Lord. Absolutely nothing. You can't bring your old dead life. Brother Kunkel would call it by its right name. Your old stinking life. You, <laughs> you can't bring that to Jesus. Come, come, my dear friends. I don't care how cultured you are, how educated you are. If you are a sinner, you are dead. You can't bring that to Jesus. 
That's why he gives us life. Praise the Lord. And he gives us life so that we may come and voluntarily lay down that life. Now, a lot of people say, preacher, you know, this sanctification, this holiness seems so difficult. And I, it, it was to me at a, at a certain time, but oh, I want to thank God that he has been clearing up and clearing up and clarifying. And now it is so utterly beautiful. Now, here is this kernel of wheat. It is a live thing. It's not a pebble. It is live. Praise God. And now Jesus says, if this little kernel of wheat doesn't fall into the ground and die, it remains just a single seed. That's the trouble with too many of us. We're just a single seed. But he says, if it falls into the ground and die, then praise God, it's going to bring forth abundant fruit. Now, I, I like the little process here, and uh, this may not be theological, but oh, it is practical. And wherever it breaks down theologically, just, you know, ask the, ask the teachers to fill up for you. But here is, this, here is this grain of wheat, this kernel of wheat. If we are going to come to this matchless death, there must not only be a miraculous birth, there must be a matchless death. And it is matchless. I, I like that word. Because consecration and dying is really, in a sense, a matchless thing. I know it has pain, but in a sense, it is a matchless thing. Nothing to compare with it, really. There must be total consecration. If we are going to come to this matchless death, there must be total consecration. Now, what is this big thing, consecration? I like what this little kernel of wheat says to me. If that kernel of wheat is to produce, the Bible talks about it's falling into the ground. Now, if it is to fall into the ground, I must let it go. It can't fall unless I let it go. It must be released. If even you have this super uh, machinery with which you plant, at some point that machinery must release the seed. Is that right? It can't hold the seed and, and you still plant your field. There must be a letting go. Now, friends, if we are going to totally consecrate, there must come a point where we totally let go to God. Now, some people say, Preacher, I'm afraid to let go to God because I don't know what God will do. I don't know what he will ask me to do. I don't know where he will send me. I'm afraid. Friends, think about it seriously. Are you afraid of the one who loves you more than anybody else in the world can love you? Are you afraid to let go yourself to your wife? Are you afraid to let go yourself to your husband? Maybe we ought to be afraid to let go ourselves to some wives. I don't mean, I don't mean here in Circleville, you understand that. I, I, I don't mean here. You're not thinking I mean here at all. But, but maybe some people in some parts of the world ought to be afraid to let go themselves to their wives or to their husbands. But oh, if you have a loving wife or a loving husband, you're not afraid. Praise God. Praise God. God, the loving God, afraid to let go myself to him? And strange, we let go ourselves to the devil, or he snatches us or something, mesmerizes us or something, and smashes up our lives, but we say we are afraid, and that's the devil's old lie and trick behind it all. And when you get weird thoughts about God, they are not God's thoughts about himself. Come, come, my dear friends. You know, sometimes and I have a little situation and it seems something I don't want to do and 
I have a way to face it, Lord. I just be honest. I tell him, look, Lord, I don't seem to want to do this. But if you want me to do it, I will do it. And in that moment of release and com commitment, this is the answer that I get sometime. Where did you ever get the idea that I wanted you to do that? <laughs> we can create very weird thoughts about God. You know what God said to me? Because, you see, I have this kind of nature too. If I really love God, you know, I could go lie down in the street in downtown Circleville. You know what God said to me one day? He said, son, would you ask your darling daughter to go lie down in the middle of the city to prove that she loves you? And I said, Lord... You know I have better sense than that. Amen. That would be the last way to prove love. I would be a sadist trying to destroy the self-respect of my daughter. What kind of love would that be, really? Come, come, my friends. What kind of love would that be? That would be brutality or something like that. And yet, we don't credit God with more sense than we credit ourselves with. Come, come, my friends. Afraid to let go myself to God? Well, he's the one who loves me. He's the one who knows the best for me. And he only wants the best for me. If God shuts a door, it is best for me. If he opens a door, it is best for me. If he denies me, it is best for me. If he gives me, it is best for me. You don't have anybody in the whole wide world who loves you as much as God and who can care for you as much as God. I'm afraid to let go, he said. Well, you've got to let go then. Until you let go, there's going to be no matchless death. Until you let go. And I mean really let go. And I know that's difficult to explain. But friends, it just means this. I just don't have any more control of myself. Voluntarily, I've given that control to God. <coughs> Whenever the pressures come, whenever the temptations come, I say to Satan, I have voluntarily given control, priority to God. It's his word first, not mine. Oh, it's so beautiful and wonderful. Absolutely, totally. Let go, completely. Self, wife, children, houses, lands, money, the whole works. I don't have anything. It's all God's I have let go. Have you let go? You know, some of us say we have let go. We're all on the altar. And then Dr. Carter reaches out to get an offering for Circleville Bible College. And suddenly the little wallet starts to disappear on the altar. Like, like a magician, you know. Next thing you hear, that thing looked as though it was on the altar. But there was a little fine black string leading to the owner and just as soon as general superintendent klein reaches out his hand to get that wallet to take out some of god's money the wallet begins to do a, dis a disappearance act does that happen here in, in in your country well you're not let go friends when you let go you really let go Come, don't look at me like that. The pocketbook is there. The bank account is there. It's all there. God help yourself. You really look scared. Oh dear God help us. That's what letting go is all about. And some of us need to get that extra courage to say, God, it is done. Praise God. And you, and you don't need to keep coming revival after revival to do it again. I think this business of reconsecration is, is almost destroying us. We do it and it is done. Amen. 
You go up there to get married and you say, I will. Amen. You sign your name. At least that's what we do in the Caribbean. There is a letting go. Lady, would you like to marry any man? You come down to the altar with him and the preacher says, will you? And he says, uh, well, 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 I, 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 well, maybe next week I'll say the will. No biz. You expect him to do it and be done and to come like a man and say, I've made up my mind and this is what I'm going to do. You know, we all like to hold on, but we've got to let go if we want to be totally consecrated. In the Caribbean days when I was coming up, we still had to write a letter to the parents to ask for the hand of the lady. And oh, I was so fearful, I was so fearful. Pray, Lord, please, please, Lord, I want to be right. Lord, I want to be sure. Lord, please reveal, please, please, Lord. Thank God I had a dear little mother who gave me a little nudge. Son, don't you think it's time? Don't you think it's... All these fearful people, fearful people. God help us. That too is a part of self. Fearful. So I sat down and wrote the letter. Put it in an envelope. Went down to the mailbox. Push it into the slot. But friend, I grabbed on to the little corner. And I just stood there, I just stood there. I knew as long as I had that little corner, I could retrieve the whole thing. <laughs> there I stood, there I stood. It almost seemed like eternity. And then suddenly I said, come on, you old coward. Drop it. Hallelujah. It's gone beyond retrieve. There must be a letting go of self. But there is not only a letting go of, a se of self, there is a lostness to sight. That little kernel falls into the ground and it is covered up with earth. Oh God, here I go now lostness to sight you know we don't like to be lost to sight it's see me Is that right and promote me and pamper me and please me and prefer me but friends it'll never work we must be hid with christ in god when we make up our minds to go all the way with jesus we make up our minds to lose ourselves in him. Come, come, my friends. Standing before you and preaching for, for victory in my heart means no more than if I wasn't appearing at all. For it isn't A.W. Taylor that matters. It is Christ and Christ alone who matters. Hallelujah. No longer I but Christ. Lost in him. Praise God. A lostness to sight. Technically. Not always pushing yourself and I must be seen and I must be front and I and I and I and I and I. No, 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 my friends. We are lost in him. You still want to be seen? Well, if you still want to be seen, you're not going to have victory. The only real victory is when I am lost in him. If you see me, you must see me in him and through him and for him. Praise God. There is a letting go of self and there is a lostness to sight. But in this total consecration, there is a thorough cleansing. When we let go self, and when we are lost to sight, something happens, which I want to call thorough cleansing. You call it whatever you want theologically. When that kernel of wheat falls into the ground, the Bible says it dies. Now, you know what happens? 
Over that little kernel of wheat, there is a nice little water-coated protective shell. Isn't it? A nice little skin protecting that kernel. When that kernel falls into the ground, it loses its husk, I call it, of self-deification. That little husk, that little self-shell, which defense, it, it is a self-defense and it is a self-deification. It's, it's a self-coating. And oh, I tell you, that self-coating is something, friends. It is something. We set up ourselves. There we are. It is I, it is I, it is I. Friends, you know why people get mad? I mean carnally angry. They get carnally angry because they are so big and important that nobody is to cross them. Do you know why we get jealous? We get jealous because we are it. And nobody else must be like us. Come, come, my friends. You trace any carnal trait you want, and it all goes back to self-deification. I get proud. It is because I am so important. Oh, God, help us. But do you know, friends, only God is really important. Our importance comes in him. We have to lose that husk of self-deification and self-defense. Have you ever had an experience since you've been saved that you were put on the spot and before you hardly knew it, you told a lie to save yourself from embarrassment? I tell you, Brother Klein, they really have straight faces in this place. Have you ever had an experience like that? You were put on the spot. You were, you were going to be embarrassed. And before you knew it, you pushed up something to save people from seeing the real you. And that something that you push up is a lie to save yourself. You know why? Because you think so much of your poor little self that you mustn't be embarrassed. When you lose the husk of self-defense, there I am. There I am, just as I am, just as I am. Here I am. I am human. I make mistakes. I, I forget. I, I fail. And here I am. I may even do something that's wrong. And here I am. And I must say I'm sorry and forgive me. Here I am. I am just as I am. Amen. Amen. And friends, you want to know real joy, you want to know real glory, it is to get to the end of that self-deification, that self-defense. Oh, what victory! Oh, what rest! Oh, what peace! To get to the end of yourself. Praise the Lord. No more covering up and no more, you know, all that fussy. You know, you know why we have so many problems in the church? Somebody won't, isn't humble enough and big enough to say, I'm wrong. And why can't they say, I am wrong? Because they are too important. I am God, and God is not supposed to be wrong. The only problem is that you are not God. Amen. Come, come, my dear friends. Oh, if we can only get to the place to lose that husk of self-defense, self-deification, and then something else happens to the seed, it loses its hope of self-dependence. You know the little seed has a bit of food in to start the new um, life going. But after a while that, that husk is all gone and that little food is all gone. And instead of being shut up to only the little food within that little shell, that root has all of God's earth and all of God's sunshine and all of God's water to draw on. And when we lose ourselves in God, and when we come to the end of self, when we die to our selfish selves, we are then uh, opened up to our resources become all of God. 
You want your Sunday school teaching to be better. You want your singing to be better. You want your preaching to be better. You want your Christian life to be better. Get out of your little self. Get into the largeness of God. Hallelujah. I've got good news for you, friends. If we'll have a miraculous birth and a matchless death, thank God we will come to a marvelous rising. A marvelous rising. When you think that you're dead and all gone, then praise God, you see the little green shoots begin to appear. Hallelujah. There is a transfiguring change. There is a transfiguring change. Another likeness appears. Not the little kernel of wheat that you put into a ground, but now a beautiful wheat growth comes up here. And see the beauty of it. And friends, when we die and die to self and lose ourselves in God, there is another likeness. There is a Christ-likeness about us. Amen. Hallelujah. There is a loveliness about you. Your husband will realize it. Your wife will realize it. Your children will realize it. Your pastor will realize it. That there is another likeness to you. Praise the Lord. All that carnal behavior now becomes Christ-like behavior. And you are lovely like your Lord. Praise God forevermore. Do we have some lovely people here? There is another likeness. There is not only another likeness. There is appropriate progress. But remember, that tree has to grow, doesn't it? You grow, you grow. You are more like your Lord. I tell people today that I speak to my wife more kindly today than I did ten years ago. I am sweeter to her today than I was five years ago. I am mastering holiness today better than I did ten years ago, five years ago, a year ago. Praise God. There is an appropriate growth. You're growing in grace and growing and growing. You know, friends, some of us have been so curt and crisp and short in our whole dispositional makeup that not even here at the altar God can get out all that curtness and shortness from your voice. You have to learn to speak like holiness people. Come, come, my friend. Some of you have been born with so much fear and anxiety. A dear God can't get it all out there when you're at the altar. He gets you. And then you have to work out all those habits of anxiety. Come, come, my friends. Some of you have practiced doubting and fearing for so long that God gets you. Thank God for that gift. You have to begin to work out and rub out and, 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 and clear out all of that awful doubty doubty from your disposition. I'm not talking about carnal doubt now. I'm talking about constitutional mental attitudes. Come, come, my friends. Appropriate growth. A dear friend of mine on Camp Brown said to me this morning, he wouldn't know what a blessing it was. He says, you know, I'm getting to love you more and more. I, I, I knew why. I knew why. Because since I saw him last, God has been doing some wonderful things in my life. Amen. You know, you know sometimes we go around so uptight and nervous. We've got to be careful. The I's have to be dotted and the T's have to be crossed. The Lord says, so come on, Wingrove. You've got to get out of that kind of tight, tense living. And you just have to relax in me. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's just relaxing in Jesus. Appropriate progress. And of course, an amazing fruitfulness. Hallelujah. And there is more to it than a transfiguring change. There is a triumphant conclusion. For Jesus says, those who love me, serve me, follow me, shall be with me where I am. So when you seem to lose yourself and make that good investment of letting go yourself and total consecration, thank God there is going to be great interest over in God's other world where you enjoy all the boundless fullness of eternity.
the way to abundant living? There must be a miraculous birth. There must be a matchless death. There will be a marvelous rising. For when you die with Christ, you will not remain there. He didn't remain there. Praise God. Hallelujah. It was not possible for death to hold him because he was a sinless God. And when you die with him, it will not be possible for death to hold you. You won't be just a disintegrated, forgotten person. You will then be remembered. For you will rise with him to the largeness and loveliness of his life. Where are you spiritually tonight, my friend? If you don't know him and you try to save your life, the Bible says you will lose it. Come on, friends. Every sinner here tonight will lose his life. Every unsanctified believer here is in terrible danger of losing that life eternally. But when you lay it down and say, God, here it is. Thank God it comes up to a marvelous and glorious rising. Amen. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Amen. Brother, do you have a song to sing for us? While our brother sings, and you're here believing you're not sanctified, and we all know, yes, we all know it's a little later than, than, than normal, but I believe that the only people who will use that as an excuse are people who really don't either mean business or need help. But I believe that people whom the Holy Spirit is talking to can still be reached tonight. Amen. While our brother sings, will you get right out of your seat if you have not been born again and say, I want to be born again. If you're here tonight and you have not really let go all, and friends, it must be, it's, it's not a joke, it's not, just real, it's not just words, it's not just theology, it's more than that. You'd be amazed. One of the great problems in the church is self. You recognize that? Do I speak the truth? One of the great problems in our home, self. The thing that's breaking up marriage is self. The thing that creates tension in church itself, self. That's the problem. Why don't you come and lay down yourself? Sing, please, brother. Come on, let's pray. Come on, just ask somebody to let you out. Let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Thank God for this dear God. Come on, let's pray. Some of you got saved last night. Let's go on and, and be sanctified. Amen. And come on, come on, let's pray. You know self has been plaguing you. Me come you know self has been plaguing you. Come on, let's get to the end of ourselves. Let's come to this matchless God. death. Let's lay down I our lives. Come. Let's let go. We've been holding on I and afraid to let go. Come. Just a minute, brother. And wouldn't it be a wonderful night? Somebody says, oh, I'm afraid Amen. to let go because God may call me to the ministry. Friends, if you let go and God calls you to the ministry, you'll be the happiest person in all the world. Amen. I'm afraid to let go because God may call me to the mission field. If you let go and God calls you to the mission field, you could never be happier if you were in North America. Oh, God will never take advantage of you. That's only your selfish fear and the devil trying to frighten you. Don't let him do it. Pastor, are you here tonight? With all your preaching of the doctrine, you have never really let go. And self still disturbs you. Come, friends, let's mind the Lord tonight. Wife, husband, that self is, is just about to ruin your life. Let go and let God have his way tonight. Hand it over to God. Lose yourself in him. Let him cleanse that self-life. Die, my friends, to the husk of self-defense. Die to the hope of self-dependence. Let's get our dependence on God. God, you are all, all in all. Didn't the young people sing it? You must be Lord of all or not at all. Let's give him all tonight. Sing, please, brother. Just as I am. Come on, get right up and come. Will you? Get right up and come. Get right up and come. Amen. Get right up and come. Come before the, the, the pools of the Holy Spirit blessings. Come on, my friends. Come before the, the, the moving of the Spirit lips. Come while God is talking. Come while saints are praying. Come, come, will you? Amen. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Of God. Amen. I come. Amen. I come. Give me a moment, brother. You know, I like that scripture where Jesus says John was a bird burning and shining light and for a while you rejoiced in his light you can rejoice in the other man's victory but until you let go yourself you'll never get your own victory and I know what I'm talking about friends I've seen other people free and oh how I long for that freedom but you know one night in my own church I was pastor at the time unfortunately it seems that this thing had eluded this glorious gift had eluded I wanted a blessing didn't realize I needed burying. One night in my own church, in a revival meeting, I was so disturbed by myself, by my own selfish way. That one Wednesday night, I walked down to the altar. But you know, even that was self, because it was a sort of I can do it. I can, I, you know, I can, I can get, you know, I can do that. I, I, I can get this bad job over with. I didn't even get it done. By Thursday, I was in more trouble. By Friday, the Holy Spirit was dealing with me so powerfully that I nearly fell on the platform. But that night, I say, God, I am coming to the end of myself tonight. And I walk down, and the prayer was not long. I say, Lord, I am sick and tired of Wingrove Taylor life. Please put spirit life within me. Full spirit life. A short prayer, but I had committed all. I had let go. Friends, don't rejoice in somebody else's light. You get your own tonight. If you are not among the twice born, come and be born tonight. If you are not among those who have had a matchless death, a definite voluntary consecration, a letting go to God, and your self-life has been cleansed, come tonight. You'll never make it through to heaven without it. We are standing and singing prayerfully, please. Stand, everybody, reverently and prayerfully. Just as I am, thou wilt come on, let's receive. Come on, let's mind the Lord. Wilt, wilt, come on, let's... Come. Let's just have a marvelous response to God. Amen. Let's just have a marvelous response to God. Amen. Come, come, friends. Just come. Amen. Come, let's just have a marvelous response. God bless you, dear lady. God bless you. Amen. Let's just have a marvelous response to God. Amen. Amen. Let's just have a marvelous response to God. just say one more word for Lord for the Lord listen listen carefully listen carefully there are some of you standing back there you know you need this kind of victory but somehow that self-life is too proud to yield that self-life is too big to let go friends here is what I came up to that night I said look Wingrove Taylor it doesn't make sense. In fact, God seemed to impress it on my heart. 
It doesn't make sense to stand where you are and lose your soul in hell rather than walk a few feet and hop.